Loretta, if you if we'll have a, if you'd like to start, and then I'll yeah. introduce Chris afterwards. Okay. So, well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so I'm going to talk for um, six minutes, right, about the Islamic State. So let's start with what do we know about it? Not very much. Um, the media has projected um, primarily its barbarous uh, side. So you know, we all know about the beheading. Uh, we all know about the ethnic cleansing uh, and religious cleansing that is taking place in the territories that the Islamic State has conquered and is controlling. Uh, we also know that um, it is potentially an agent of destabilization inside the Middle East and possibly even a threat uh, to us uh, in the West. So this is all that we know. Um, what we do not know, and this is what I try to present in uh, the book, The Islamic Phoenix, is another side of the Islamic State. Number one, this is the first armed organization that has succeeded in the transition into a state. So he has created a state, which is quite big. So we're talking about a territory that can be as big as um, France or Texas. Uh, this is the first time that something like this happened. Um, it's also um, an organization that is uh, running the state um, with uh, a certain uh, sensitivity to the needs of the population, and that is very modern because he has realized that you can't possibly run a state today simply by oppressing people. You need to achieve consensus. Now, this is a major step forward in the way armed organization uh, act. Um, the PLO, for example, when he was in the occupied territories in Palestine was not showing the same kind of approach to the consensus among the population. So um, because of that, um, the way the state is run is also very pragmatic. So they enter um, agreements and joint venture for the exploitation of the resources that they have conquered with the local population through the tribal leaders. Um, which, of course, makes them uh, appear to the um, people. Excuse me, Loretta, sorry to interrupt, but people are in the audience are saying they're having trouble hearing. Is it not loud enough, or if you could speak closer to the microphone? More like this. Yeah? Uh, is that okay? Okay. It's very close. <laughs> I just all right, so, um, so the element of consensus is fundamental. Um, so this is a much more serious enemy than we are led to believe. Um, let's look, for example, at another interesting aspect is um, the message that the Islamic State is sending to us and to the Muslim population that shows uh, in a very in-depth knowledge of the psychology, the different psychology between uh, Western and Muslim. While they terrorize us uh, through this beheading and also these images uh, of barbarous behavior, um, they send to the Muslim youth a very seductive message. And this seductive message is a positive message. Um, in the old days, al-Zarqawi and al-Qaeda uh, were sending a negative message. Come, you know, become a suicide bombers and live happily for the eternity with the 72 virgins. This time it's not like that at all. The message is come and help us build a new state, your state, the first, the first Sunni state. So the first time that the message is, for the first time that political utopia, the Sunni political utopia, which has been there for centuries to recreate the caliphate, to create a state that will protect every single Muslim, is actually taking shape. And 
the message is come and help us. You are an engineer, so you can come and help us running uh, you know, the dams, the water dams. So you are a doctor, you, you can come and help us uh, you know, vaccinating children against uh, uh, polio. So this is a very, very seductive message, but also it's a very modern message, very different from Al-Qaeda, where, you know, of course, even using a radio or TV was prohibited. These guys use two weapons. You know, one is the true weapon, which is, of course, a military weapon, but the other one is the iPhone. So through that, they also use modern technology, and they reach us everywhere. Um, so just to conclude my six minutes, the other interesting aspect of this state is the manipulation of the media that they have achieved. We heard from them when they wanted them to be known, which is in June 2014, but they've been there since 2011, and we'll talk about that, about the origins. And the moment in which they wanted us to know their existence, and they wanted us also to know how powerful they are, you know, they did it. And the Western media and even the politicians, unfortunately, I think they fell into that trap. Uh, so we need to understand which kind of enemy we're facing. Otherwise, you know, we're going to lose this battle as we have lost the previous one. Thanks. Thank you, Loretta. And, uh... That's, that's really rare to find a speaker who sticks to the six minute time limit. So uh, <laughs> congratulations for that. Okay, <coughs> let's see if we can go two minutes. for two. Uh, a senior fellow at the Nation Institute and a columnist for Truth Dig, Chris Hedges spent nearly two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans, with 15 years at the New York Times. He is the author, among others, of War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, and Death of the Liberal Class. <coughs> I'm sorry. His most recent book with Joe Sacco is Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, a New York Times bestseller and Amazon.com best book of the year. Chris Hedges. Thanks. Um, I, I will just also say that I spent uh, seven of those years in the Middle East. I was the Middle East Bureau Chief for the New York Times. I'm an Arabic speaker. <laughs> Uh, and I spent a lot of my times with groups uh, that are listed on the State Department terrorism list from the PKK to Hamas to Islamic Jihad to Al-Qaeda. Um, what we are seeing in the Middle East is a creation of our own mismanagement and the doctrine of preemptive war, which under post-Nuremberg laws is a war crime, an act of aggression. Um, we, through the process of endless war, and this is what happens when you open that Pandora's box of violence, you, you essentially lose control of the narrative that you're trying to impose by force. And that, I think, has become evident in the current <coughs> situation uh, in Iraq and Syria, where uh, we now find ourselves functioning, uh, especially in Syria, as the Air Force for Bashar al-Assad, um, Hezbollah, and Iran, all of which are fighting rebel forces in Syria. We have taken sides in the civil war that we fomented in Iraq, and, and the chief result of the occupation in Iraq is that we have destroyed Iraq as a unified country. It's never coming back. Uh, it's been partitioned in the north with the Kurds uh, and, uh, and between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Uh, we um, have, in many ways, completely changed sides um, because of the kind of shifting sands of violence that have taken place throughout the region. When you carry out, and it, it, it's difficult if you have not been on the receiving end of the industrial weapons that we employ, the cruise missiles, 
the uh, 90 millimeter tank rounds, 155 howitzers, uh, attacks from Apache helicopters, F-16s. It's hard to describe the explosive or the, the lethal power of these kinds of ordinances. Hellfire missiles, for example, not only kill within a very wide radius, but suck the oxygen out of the air so that you'll find bodies on the ground that have no mark on them, but they've suffocated to death. And to sort of use the whole notion of surgical strikes or human rights when you employ these kinds of weapons uh, is an absurdity. And we have been for over a decade uh, dropping these kinds of ordinances indiscriminately uh, throughout the region. Uh, and the result has been uh, a, a horrific brutalization of the population. Um, I mean, the fact is, as a nation, we have beheaded far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever beheaded. Uh, and yet, the, the narrative that is presented to us as a public is so sanitized that we have no cognizance of number one, what we've done or how we are perceived. The only thing we see is the result. That final, you know, after that long, slow drip of humiliation, of suffering, of death, of incohate rage, that final spasm of violence that expresses itself in an act of barbarity such as the beheading of a hostage. But the fact is, there is no moral difference between a militarized drone strike hmm. and cutting somebody's head off with a knife. Um, we use the weapons that we have and they use the weapons that they have. And I think one of the reasons that uh, Loretta's book is important is because she's right. And, and I spent a year of my life covering Al-Qaeda for the New York Times. And in that this group has characteristics within it that we have not seen in other groups. Not least of which is the heavy infusion of foreign fighters. Al-Qaeda had very few. It was a clan-based organization. That's why it was very hard for Western intelligence agencies to penetrate, but it, they were also a lot easier to control. We now have several hundred people who are carrying EU, Canadian, Australian, yeah. and even US passports. And uh, they have quite astutely done, and I was telling Loretta this before, very much what uh, Tito's partisans did at the end of World War II, where they realized that it was the competing jihadist groups around them who were their greatest threat to power. They took, as Tito did, Western weapons supplies that were supposed to be used against the Germans, used them against those competing groups, and stockpiled them so that they could could essentially take over Yugoslavia or carve out territory. And that's very much what al-Baghdadi has done um, quite successfully. Um, and, and makes this, even al although it has antecedents in al-Qaeda itself, uh, makes it a very different organization from al-Qaeda that didn't seek to maintain territory. And there was always that split between al-Qaeda and nationalist groups like the Gama Islamiya in Algeria um, because they were essentially nationalist groups that were trying to create Islamic states. And I would just close by saying um, that Loretta is also very right, and Karen Armstrong makes this point when she writes about uh, fundamentalism in the name of God, that while these people go back to a particular mythical, utopian vision of the past, um, they are thoroughly modern organizations, including in terms of their own religious ideology, although they painted with a veneer of, um, you know, uh, a kind of uh, authentic, um, you know, old world kind of religion. Christian right, I wrote a book on the Christian right, does, does exactly the same thing. Um, and, you know, I think Loretta would agree with me that uh, one of the things that's distressing is how um, we have allowed this group to essentially become a cartoon version of Islamic terror, mm. um, which fits with a narrative and a dehumanization of Muslims um, without ever understanding our own role in its creation or how this group 
has made a really massive leap uh, in terms of what it's able to do and how it's formed and how different it is from groups that have come before. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'm going to throw out a few questions and get the discussion rolling. And uh, remember to write down your questions if you have any. Um, so this question is for Loretta, but Chris, certainly um, I would like to hear from you on this too. There's a lot of confusion, even among pretty well-informed Americans, about the military, financial, and political origins of the group variously known as ISIS, the Islamic State, or ISIL, as the Obama administration calls it. Uh, so what is the relationship with Al-Qaeda, the Al-Nusra Front? Where did, where, did this, where did ISIS originate? Where did they come from? If we could just sort of get the ISIS 101. Okay, ISIS 101. Um, well, this is a group um, that goes back to the group of Al-Zarqawi. So we're talking about radical Salafism. Um, the original name was... Why don't, you, why don't you explain what a Salafist is? Uh, yes, um, the Salafists is actually um, a movement within Islam that um, originally was actually quite liberal. It looked at the West uh, as a sort of example of um, nation state. So we're talking about the 18th, end of 18th, beginning of 19th centuries. Um, then the, it degenerated. Uh, um, to a certain extent because of colonization and it started to look at the West as actually the enemy. Uh, well, before it was a, a self-criticism of why the Arab world had not achieved the same thing that Europe had achieved, so, you know, a nation state. Uh, because of colonization, it became uh, an anti-European, anti-Western movement. Radical Salafism actually took place um, um, in the beginning of the 1990s uh, in Jordan when um, uh, the Jordanian government recognized uh, the existence of um, Israel. At that point, the reaction of a group of uh, Salafists was to reject completely the, the doctrine and go back to the origins of Islam. So go back to what Islam was uh, you know, at the beginning of the history. So um, a sort of cleansing of Islam from any kind of influence uh, through you know, the, the centuries. So uh, through this process, um, they rediscover the hatred between the Sunni and the Shia. So one of the most important um, goal of radical Salafism is actually to, um, I wouldn't say to kill, but you know, basically to get rid, uh, that's a better expression, uh, to get rid of you know, the Shia. So when um, al-Zarqawi um, arrived in Iraq, uh, um, he started his group, which, which was called Twaid al-Jihad. And one of the objectives of this group was not only to fight the um, coalition forces in Iraq, but was also to fight the Shia. So this is when you know, the, the fight between the Sunni and the Shia actually started. Now that group eventually became Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and this is, was when um, Osama bin Laden recognized um, al-Zarqawi as the emir of um, al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, but the group was never really um, an al-Qaeda group. So with the death of al-Zarqawi in 2006 uh, and the Sunni awakening, uh, which took place in 2007, together with the U.S. surge, all the jihadist groups started to have serious troubles, um, and they declined. And in particular, of course, this took place for you know the Al Qaeda in Iraq and the group that was following you know the Al Zarqawi doctrine. Let's call it like that. Um, in 2010, Al Baghdadi became the leader of what was left of the original group of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and he immediately changed the name 
to the Islamic State of Iraq. Now, at that point, that group was um, on the verge of extinction, so the decision was taken to move over to Syria, where in the meantime, uh, um, a war by proxy had started uh, because of the civil war which had taken place after the repression, the violent repression of the Arab Spring in Syria by the Assad government. So the decision was you know, to move over and tap into the war by proxy, which was funded by various countries. In particular, we're talking about Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar, um, and use those money to reconstitute the group and eventually achieve the goal of the group, which is still the same of the al zarqawi group, which was, of course, to recreate the caliphate. So um, they move um, uh, over to Syria, and um, from 2011 until the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, they used the money of the sponsor not to fight a war by proxy, but actually to attack other jihadist groups and conquer the strategic territories in order to start carving their own little enclaves, which eventually you know, became a state. They were so successful that many people decided to, from other jihadist groups, decided to join them. And this is when the merge with al-Nusra took place. Um, Al-Nusra was uh, the Al-Qaeda group in Syria, or at least you know, the affiliated you know, group in Syria. Um, the merge um, transformed the Islamic State of Iraq into the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, which is you know, ISIS. Al-Sham is the, the word, the Arabic word for Syria. Um, now that merge was heavily criticized by Al-Qaeda, in particular by al-Zawahiri, who of course you know, didn't want uh, the presence uh, of al-Baghdadi and his group in Syria. He wanted them to go back you know, to Iraq. Now, <laughs> al-Baghdadi answered in the same way the al-Zarqawi had uh, uh, 10 years before, when he was equally criticized for his action in, in Iraq by saying, you know, I follow the word of God, I'm not following the word of al zawahiri So um, from that merge onwards, the Islamic, what's now known the Islamic State, uh, um, managed to conquer larger and larger territories by self-funding itself. So it stopped needing the money of the sponsor because he had conquered enough strategic resources. And we're not only talking about oil, but we're talking about water, and we're talking about you know, agricultural land, very rich agricultural land. So um, he established itself as a new power in the region. Um, and this took place through 2013 and basically until uh, you know, June 2014. But of course, we didn't know that. <laughs> this is very interesting that intelligent didn't know, the media didn't know. And this is why before I said we knew only when they wanted us to know, when they were ready to establish themselves uh, as a new important power in the region when they declare the birth of the caliphate, which is the end of June 2014. Um, I think this would be a, a, a good question for Chris. Let, let me um, just add hear about the let caliphate. Just add, let, let me just add something quickly uh -huh. on that to highlight that which Loretta alluded to, but there were tremendous conflicts between al-Qaeda Mm, huge. Um, as there is throughout the region. For instance, Al-Qaeda, uh, Osama bin Laden never embraced the Shiite Sunni sectarian violence, for instance. No. And um, one of the things that's frustrating for those of us who come out of the region is the way that all of these groups, in the way that you, know, you kind of blanket it in the old Cold War, all communists, as if Yugoslav communists were the mm. same as you know, Czech communists. And, and in fact, these, these, uh, these groups, these Islamic groups, if you want to call them militant groups, have in tr tremendously deep divisions. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. you cannot go wading into the region until you begin to understand what those divisions are. 
Uh, for instance, Al-Qaeda has declared that uh, Hamas as apostates because they negotiate with the Israelis through Egyptian security officials. Um, what happened, just to amplify what Loretta said, what happened in Syria is, is very similar to what happened with the Taliban in, uh, during the fight against the Russians in Afghanistan. All of the, the, the money that the United States provided was funneled through the ISI, or the Pakistani Intelligence Service, mm -hmm. and for Pakistan, the issue was always India. They don't really care. They okay. had to make sure that whatever government was implanted in Kabul would be hostile to mm -hmm. their enemy, India. So therefore, the Taliban were the safest bet. And, and, and they used that money to essentially starve all of the other resistance groups. And mm -hmm. once you start sending that quantity of money and the, that quantity of weapons, weapons, as we have in Syria, you don't know where it goes. Mm -hmm. You lose control. And so the irony of what's happened with ISIS is that not only have th we, through primarily our allies like the Saudis and the Qataris, funded them, <laughs> but we've armed them completely. <coughs> yeah. One of the um, defining characteristics of most radical Islamist groups is the dream of restoring the caliphate. And so this is a two-parter, and either of you guys uh, should probably both should address it. Uh, first, if you could explain uh, exactly what the caliphate is and the dream of, and why that's so important to Muslim fundamentalist groups and why they want to restore it. So many of them do, like al-Qaeda. Uh, but also, um, to what extent is the Islamic State's uh, de declaration by al-Baghdadi that this is, that ISIS represents the new caliphate accepted as legitimate by other Islamist organizations around the, the Muslim world? Would you want uh, to? Uh, Chris, you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, the caliphate is a utopian vision. Um, they don't really want to go back to the caliphate. Um, but it is painted as a kind of return to paradise, return to simplicity, return to goodness, return to virtue. And given the incredible corruption hmm. that has beset every regime in the Middle East and even those groups that opposed the status quo, like the PLO, um, this is a very seductive appeal. And they, that appeal is particularly effective among groups of Arab or Muslim youth who have essentially been stripped of their identity so they've been born in Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco or somewhere, and they go live mm -hmm. at the age of four. They're moved to France, and they live in a banlieue, one of these horrible Stalinist like uh, suburbs, suburbs outside of Paris or Lyon or somewhere. And uh, you know, as anyone who can tell you who's lived in France, the French are awful um, to people of color, especially Arabs. Um, and so they, they experience that kind of racism in France, but then they go back to Algeria, to Oran, or wherever they're from, and they don't fit in Algeria either. And they have this kind of identity crisis. I mean, when I covered Al-Qaeda, this yeah. was the classic profile. And, and so they're alienated, they're angry, they're unemployed, um, they don't know who they are, yeah. um, they're not French, they're not Algerian, what are they? And this kind of a vision is very enticing. Mm. And, it, it, and, 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 and being enveloped in this kind of a community is very enticing. And one of the points that Loretta makes in her book, which I think is important, is that the fighters themselves are not well paid. Yeah. They make, what, $17 a month or something, right? Yeah, much less yeah. than a, a normal right. blue-collar. This, this isn't about yeah. money. Mm -hmm. 
And, and um, it is, and that of course we can go back to other partisan or uh, insurgent movements and take Tito's Yugoslavia was very much the same thing. You know, mm. we are going to build a socialist state, uh, we're going to overthrow the corrupt monarchy. Um, you know, we had it in the West in terms of the Spanish Civil War, and I think that analogy is not far-fetched, that for many in the Muslim world, um, this is their chance to reclaim their identity, to deal with their alienation, mm. to take revenge against those forces that have degraded them, and to build something utopian and beautiful. Yeah. The, the, there is the other element to add, it is the political element, of course, of the caliphate. Because, I mean, technically speaking, the, the caliph um, is the religious and political authority that is above everybody else. So every single Muslim government <laughs> is automatically below the level of the caliph. And that, of course, is a, a huge threat to countries like Saudi Arabia, because you know the House of Saud has been uh, projecting the image to be the, the monarchy that has the right to lead all the Sunni Muslim in the world, not only because, of course, it's in Saudi Arabia where you know, there is you know, Mecca, but also because of its role in leading uh, um, the doctrine and you know, the people. Um, the moment in which al Baghdadi becomes the caliph, <laughs> the House of Saud is not any longer in that position. Now, that is the real threat. This is the potential threat not necessarily in terms of the Islamic State wanting to invade Saudi Arabia, but the Islamic State's simple existence per se is a threat to the existence, the political power and religious power of the House of Saud. Now, what I think uh, that the Saudis are scared of, uh, are actually scared of, uh, a, a sort of uh, upheaval from inside Saudi Arabia um, because of the existence of the Islamic State, the will of the people um, who are not very happy inside Saudi Arabia, uh, where of course you know, we have a royal family that is you know, incredibly wealthy and the rest of, of the population, which is kept uh, under control through money, but not through you know, ideals. Um, I think you know, they're afraid that this kind of appeal will shake completely the regime of Saudi Arabia. And then people will want to join, naturally, the Islamic State, um, forming a sort of uh, federation, as it was originally the caliphate. Because the caliphate was not really a pyramidal kind of empire, but it was a much more loose uh, kind of organization. Um, and I also think that this is one of the reasons why the US foreign policy has changed. So, you know, until August, uh, until almost the end of August of this year, you know, Obama declared that he didn't have a, a policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Islamic State. So, in other words, you know, let them uh, sort themselves out. You know, the U.S. does not have a position. And then all of a sudden, within a week, uh, not only did we have a policy, but also we were leading a grand coalition of 44 countries, uh, uh, whereby you know, Saudi Arabia had offered to train uh, more troops, so you know, just, just to enlarge the war by proxy, which has caused this kind of problem. Uh, and I think it was to, it was and still is, to protect Saudi Arabia, which of course you know, is one of the reasons why the Islamic State exists. So it's almost ironic. Yeah, I think the Saudi regime is very fragile. Yeah, totally. And that's not, we see it with the number of troops the Saudis have moved up along the border. Yeah. Because they're terrified. Um, and I think that's right, that the Saudi regime collapses from within and that this kind of a movement has tremendous appeal yes. Um, yeah. among the majority of Saudis who are quite sick of this parasitic, you know, 
royal family, which produces endless numbers of princes who consume <laughs> large amounts of Lots the of GDP that. and do nothing. If, uh, if you, uh, sorry that there was a misunderstanding about the cards. Just hang on to your cards and your questions. That someone will come around and collect them. So uh, there's no need to uh, walk up and give them to me. And those of you who have, I will. They will be gone through. Uh, so one last question before we uh, see the film, which will be I'm looking forward to. And uh, th I would like definitely to hear from both Chris and Loretta on this. Um, Loretta, you argue in your book that the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria represents a new kind of entity, a, a new kind of nation state uh, for, and I wanted to hear how does, that, how does ISIS d uh, differ from the Taliban regime that ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001? They, uh, at its peak, the Taliban controlled 95% of Afghanistan. It was it had embassies in three foreign countries. It, uh, was, it, it conducted diplomatic uh, negotiations with, among other countries, the, the United States and all, over a pipeline project. Uh, so, what, um, so what's, the, what's the difference? How, is it, uh, how does it represent a, uh, a sort of a higher notion or a different notion uh, of, a, of a nation state than the, uh, than the Taliban did in Afghanistan? Well, I, I think the Islamic State um, has um, succeeded in nation building in a region where we have tried many times and <laughs> fail in nation building. Uh, um, uh, there are many differences. Uh, I mean, for a start, uh, the, the way the state has been carved is through a traditional war of conquest. I mean, the Taliban didn't do anything like that. They were put there by the Pakistani, as you know, Chris uh, has uh, very well you know, explained. Um, the war of conquest has been uh, a classic one, so it's almost door to door through trenches. Uh, uh, and this is also incredibly appealing uh, to the young people that join. It's uh, almost patriotic, uh, the way they, they went about. Um, it is in a region um, which was colonized, uh, where the borders were drawn by foreign powers. In particular, we're talking about you know, the, the UK and France. So the destruction of those borders uh, uh, was perceived uh, as a sort of liberation for the people that were living in those regions. Um, the message. Uh, I know that many people will be shocked by what I'm saying, but the message that the Islamic State is transmitting to its followers is actually an anti-imperialist message. I mean, the Taliban were never anti-imperialist. They didn't even know, even know what you know, imperialist meant. So in that, um, I think uh, they, they are modern in a way, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're also you know, very appealing to old traditions. Uh, some of the people, some of the tribes, uh, after you know, the, the knocking down of those borders, some of the tribes said, uh, you know, finally, you know, we are reunited. Uh, I mean, these are nomad tribes. So, I mean, we, we're not talking about nationalism the way the Europeans um, understand nationalism or you know even the Americans but we're talking about you know same kind of ethnic groups so we're talking about ethnicity and they were very clever I think they were very clever to start from Syria to Iraq I mean this is a region that is quite homogeneous so a majority as soon as not many um, different kind of ethnicity, but also different kind of religion. Uh, they're also pursuing a sort of um, ethnic cleansing and religious cleansing in order to create a, a state that is very, very homogeneous. Um, because it's easier to run a state that is very homogeneous, especially um, at the beginning. And then there's all the other side, which is the sort of... Um, uh, social side of 
the Islamic State when didn't exist with the Taliban, of course. Um, the, the fact that they are very sensitive to the need of the population. So uh, these, are, these are population that have been plagued by war for a very long time. They have been plagued by warlords, criminal groups, uh, uh, jihadist groups, you know, you name it. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, the Islamic State comes in and uh, works um, so that people can have access to basic infrastructure such as water or electricity. Um, they set up joint ventures with the local people uh, in order to give the local people the opportunity to grow economically. So that sensitivity also to an improvement in the everyday life and also to go back to the normality of life is something that you know the Taliban never you know, consider. In that, this is a modern state. Because if you think about, you know, what are the two most important tasks of the state within you know, the concept of the nation state, the European concept and the American concept of the nation state, is guaranteeing law and order and guaranteeing national security. These are the first two things, and this is exactly what they're doing. They're protecting the people from the internal um, criminal organization of warlords, they are protecting the borders from you know, the outside enemies. And within this kind of state, which I call it the, the shell state, because of course these people don't have you know, the right of self-determination, they seek the consensus inside in order to achieve the kind of identity, political identity, that will transform a, a state shell into a real state. Uh, I mean, I, I think this is absolutely, you know, outstanding for an armed organization. Because, you know, at the end of the day, these guys, you know, are terrorists. I mean, that's what they are. Well, you know, so, so was the Ergon. I mean, mm. uh, I think oftentimes, you know, when you don't have access to the kind of modern weaponry, uh, this was true in the Algerian Civil War. Uh, you resort to what the state defines as terrorism as a way to fight back. Um, I think one of the things that's important is to understand, and you touched on it, uh, it, it and this is, has a kind of continuity from Osadden, Osama bin Laden right on through, and that's Sykes-Picot, the 1916 agreement mm -hmm. where the colonial powers at the end of World War I just carved up the Middle East into private little spheres of influence. Yeah. Um, and if you go back and listen to Osama bin Laden, he, he's constantly talking about Sykes-Pico, as is yeah. ISIS. And, and the jubilation at the destruction of those borders is not only for ISIS, but throughout the region, yeah. a jubilation at the destruction of colonial control um, because these were, in essence, proxy states. And, um, you know, we can't forget that our meddling throughout the Middle East, I mean, Iran, for instance, had a functioning democracy mm -hmm. until we destroyed it. Yeah. And the same was true in Lebanon. And um, what we wanted were uh, client regimes that did our bidding. And so the, the breaking down of these borders has not only historical resonance in terms of the injustices and tribes were, that were cut in half and linguistic groups were cut, like the Kurds between Turkey and Syria and Iraq, um, but also a sense of liberation. Mm -hmm. And then I just will close quickly by saying that although the atrocities that have been committed by ISIS are well known, because of social media. In every conflict that I've covered, um, atrocities like that have been part of it. Certainly that was true in Bosnia. I mean, every time we went into a new town in Bosnia, the warlords had dreamt up some new way to present a corpse, including, I remember going into a town and finding all these poor Muslims literally crucified on the side of a barn. Um, so you don't see it because 
those kinds of atrocities um, were oftentimes too horrific for us to put out sure. within the mainstream press and, and, and the warlords, the, the Serbian warlords in Bosnia were not putting it out themselves. So we're seeing it, but it doesn't mean there's more. It, it means that in every insurgency or conflict, and I covered the war in El Salvador in the early 80s, and when I got there, the death squads were killing between 700 and 1,000 people a month. And this was even beyond beheadings. Hmm. You know, I mean, mutil horrific mutilations. Um, so that, that is, and, 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 and the reason that, that insurgent groups use that, or in the case of the Salvadoran military, which was losing the war, is that becomes, terror becomes a very effective hmm. weapon, yeah. especially if you don't have an air force. So why do the Iraqi, why does the Iraqi army run away when there's 10,000 of them and 2,000 of ISIS? It is because precisely of that image of terror that they seek to disseminate mm -hmm. to, although better, far better equipped, armed forces that have no real will to fight. And, and, and that becomes a very effective way to defeat forces as they have. Right. They've done it with the Peshmerga and they've done it, the Kurdish Peshmerga, and they've done it with the Iraqi National Army as well. Yeah. yeah.